So this uh, then segues us into the next portion of our meeting, which is the group discussion for long-term planning of the work group, um, which will be led by uh, Jill Fitzsimmons. Dr. Jill Fitzsimmons is an assistant research professor in the Department of Resource Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, Jill, if you want, I can do a quick summary of meeting activities so far, just to refresh folks on where we're at. Sure, go for it. Okay, um, so we opened with the regulator panel with John and Monica, um, which included a discussion of inspections and especially the challenges that came with record keeping and effective training. Then we had the data snapshot, which is a proposed project to collect, organize, and disseminate information and statistics about food processing in the Northeast. Um, Yesterday afternoon, uh, Donna discussed the challenges and solutions that she's encountered uh, in doing remote PCQI trainings, um, as well as an update on FSPCA leadership. Uh, Martin reviewed the curriculum changes and anticipated timelines for implementation, how it's going to impact both trainers and ideally be recognized for HACCP certification. Uh, next in the afternoon, we had the working group do their updates. So the PCHF website is under review, which we need your feedback for. Um, and uh, we're gonna try and get it up to date, get it up to speed. At that point, it will be handed off to the awareness subgroup who will do the site launch and get it spread out to you guys so that it can then move on to processors. Um, this project is nearing its completion, which we're really excited about. Um, and so we're almost there. Um, after that was the evaluation subgroup presentation. So the evaluation tool has been developed um, and now we need it to be implemented um, so that we can evaluate trainings, develop a standard of what training looks like in the Northeast and be able to compare it. Um, it will be a really useful tool that um, we can use to all improve our work and to improve regional knowledge. It's a matter of really getting it into people's hands and implementing it now. Um, and then lastly, we just heard from Andrea, but I, we just heard from Andrea. So I think we understand where we're at with that. Um, it is again, another um, PC working group project that we're nearing completion. And so we have this great sort of opportunity where all of these things are finally getting out and getting usable. And so you now we have more. Great. Um, well, it sounds like you guys have been pretty busy. Um, so uh, as Annie said, my name is Jill Fitzsimmons, and I, I, I've met a number of you, but not all of you. I'm an economist, a social scientist, but I've been working with a handful of you guys over the last, I don't even know, three or four years. <laughs> so I have, um, they, the Annie and Elizabeth um, asked me to help facilitate this session because I have like sort of a working knowledge of all the language and all of your acronyms. And so hopefully um, I have, you know, some awareness of the issues that you guys have been grappling with. But of course, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not in it as a, as a food safety person. So um, my job here is to help facilitate a conversation about what the future formation of the Preventive Controls Working Group should be. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I just, after some consultation with folks, we sort of came up with a general structure for this conversation. Can everyone see that? Okay. So we have about an hour and a half. Is that right? Yes. Okay. We have about an hour and a half. So let me just say, first of all, that it's really, as a social scientist, it's really gratifying to see you guys um, doing the work to sort of step back and do self-evaluation. And so, you know, I don't even know how many years ago now, Andrea, we, we started that, you started that process and I was helping you guys with the sort of setup of that process, um, you know, and some of the question design. And it's really, it's really gratifying to see that, that you are all invested in this conversation and that you're putting the work in to sort of do, you know, do the due diligence to understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish and what the best way to get there is. So I just wanna say that I appreciate it. I really am, it's, it's exciting to see results. So thank you for sharing those results. Um, okay, so let's see my slide. There we go. So the 
Uh, just to sort of give a perspective, you guys have your preventive controls working group. And the larger goal of this group is to increase the technical support and educational guidance to small processors affected by PC, right? So how can NECAFs achieve this particular long-term goal? Um, and the objective for this session is to really kind of take a step back and say, is this working group on the right track? If it is on the right track, how are we going to improve it? Or how are you going to improve it? And if it's not on the right track, what should NECAFs be doing instead of the working group structure as it exists right now? OK, so just to give a quick outline, we're going to go through, we're already a little late, but we're going to go through and we're going to uh, summarize. No, we're not late because Annie just did this. She summarized the conference so far. I'm going to ask Amanda to really rein it in and give a one minute <laughs> Back background backstory of the working group itself in, in just a minute. Um, uh, and then we're going to do some conversation. This is really a conversation session about the challenges encountered by the working group so far. And then we're going to move into how should or could the working group um, structure itself to better reflect the work that needs to be done. Um, so just as a, as a recap, just as a framing, so we all remember the Preventive Controls Working Group over the past few years has had three components, I think committees are what they're called, and one of them is the Evaluation Committee, one of them is the Resources Committee, and one of them is the Awareness Committee. So Amanda, take it away, I'm going to give you one minute, if you can, can keep the backstory to one minute. Thanks, Jill. Go back to the, the pillars there, I guess, is the, so I, I'm just grooming to remind you, I guess, what the Preventive Controls Working Group is looking to achieve today is reflection and candid uh, feedback. One of the things that's been so exciting is because of these meetings, we've been able to have these discussions about how do we best address the target audience and, you know, validate, uh, I sidebar sell validating feelings, but more importantly, what we've been able to do in the past was prioritize and we realized, okay, before you could do this, you need to do this. Before we need to do this, you have to do this. And that's how we kind of evolved into these three pillars. But as Annie just mentioned a moment ago, a lot of these projects have pinnacle milestones that will be achieved between now and the next six months. And so what we want to have a discussion with you all is, do we need, do we want to keep these three pillars? Is there a new, based on the work that Andrea just shared about the needs, do we need to re-evaluate what this focus should be on? That's where we want to go. So we're not held on these three pillars, but rather want to reflect on that. What is working? What doesn't work? And what direction do we want to go on between now, next year, and a few years out? So the idea was to kind of share and reflect on the, the successes we have presently, but then also start thinking about how we can build a strategy that continues to build on that um, momentum. Great, thank you. It was a little over a minute, but I'll give it to you. Good job. All right, so um, so I guess the first thing I wanna say is let's just first go back to the larger goal of what the working group is. And the first thing is, you know, I wanna make sure just as a, as a gut check that everybody agrees that this should be the larger goal, right? Uh, is there anyone who wants to raise this conversation or do we all, I'm gonna assume if nobody raises it now that we're all on board that this is the larger goal for the working group. Does anyone want to address that or question that? And, and this is, it's good to do that, right? This is the purpose of this call is to sort of dig into this stuff. Does anyone have any concerns with the framing of this larger goal? All right. So Annie, did you want oh, to say something? This is something I think about a little bit. To what extent are we sort of providing the support and guidance to processors? And to what extent are we just supporting the larger preventive controls community as they do the direct work. Um, and I think this is, it's a little bit of a balancing act, but it's something that I think sometimes we straddle the line with is rather than directly helping processors, we're really focused on that like middle ground of helping those who help processors. So what you're saying is that, that or what at least what I think I hear you saying is that one of the things that is not specified so far or hasn't been in the past is who the target audience for your work is. Mm -hmm. And that may have raised some confusion about what, what is really, the, what the purpose and what the sort of activity should be. Is that true? So, that so perhaps there needs to be some clarification about is the target audience the, per, the processors themselves? Is it the communicators as Andrea defined for us earlier? Or is it some, you know, are there multiple tracks 
of target audiences, but do we need to clarify when we're talking about you know, evaluation, awareness, et cetera, which, which target audience is really in mind? Um, is, that, is that a fair, does anyone else wanna weigh in on that sort of distinction? Did, can I get, um, we're gonna go for emoji uh, voting. Can I get a, a thumbs up or thumbs down from people if you, if you agree that that's something that needs to be considered? We've got one thumbs up, a few thumbs up. And and just so you guys know, I'm I'm you know I teach classes, so I'll start calling on people. <laughs> I'm not shy about that. So oh, there we go. There's our thumbs. All right, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so it sounds like for the most part, people people agree that that is something that needs to be considered. So we will. That is something to um to note. And I forget now who's the note taker on this session. Is that I am. Okay. All right. So Annie, take notes about the thing that you just said. <laughs> I can do that. Okay. All right, great. Um, and so let's move through this kind of question about um, is this working group, uh, let's see, what are the challenges that we've encountered so far? So I'm gonna start out with this framework. And if we get some good participation, we'll stick with this framework of just having these sort of bulleted questions, trying to encourage conversation. If not, we have, I have another tool we can use to try to do a little bit more of the, um, concerted, you know, sort of task oriented uh, conversation. So let me just ask if anyone can, um, it, you know, you could sort of deal with these bullets or are there other challenges that people want to toss out? Um, Annie just tossed one out about identifying the target audience. Does anyone else have any sort of challenges they see with the organization of the PC working group at this point? No. Nope. Okay. Donna, I'm going to ask you. Oh, Beth, thank you. Beth, go for it. Yeah, I can say just um, kind of being involved in one of the groups is um, something that uh, one of the biggest challenges we've had is just having people to execute some of the work that we want to do. And so, um, so for some of the projects and some of the things that we that we go after, it's if you don't have who can dedicate time to it. Um, and really make it a priority, then it kind of just gets put to the bottom of the list. Um, so a lot of us are volunteer our time <laughs> to participate. Um, and then Annie is paid by kneecaps. So that's why she was really able to ex execute things um, in getting that website up and going and putting those resources in and spending the hours to catalog all of that information. So um, that's just one of the big things that I've noticed just working is having people on the ground who can actually do some of the work and carry out these projects. That's or what, what if committee, we, oh, sorry. Or and then I was just gonna say, if we don't have people to do like, who can really do that, then we have to sort of think about projects that we can design where it can be a light, lighter load for people to carry. Um, would you just say which committee just for, for context for me more than anything <laughs> which committee that you're you're referring to it's the resources so okay. group okay so so what i hear you saying is that um there's this it's a working group but but once you've identified the needs or the resources that are needed then it's sort of like okay then who who does it right like and and to some extent there might be a pipeline where the ideas can be written up into a grant but of course that's a whole bunch of work itself right to do and then the question is who does that and who owns that and who follows through on that um does i think that's that's really that's <laughs> it's a common problem <laughs> but it's really important to identify that like so so once you have everybody bringing their expertise to the room what are the what's the sort of structural piece of the working group and how, and how can kneecaps rethink the structure of what the working group is to understand what that um you know who's going to follow through and might it might be a certain amount of like um triaging right so it might be that one of the things that kneecaps needs to bring in the the pc working group needs to do is have some other structure to say well once these ideas have been developed and generated what is the decision process to prioritize where the resources, like the staffing resources go or the grant writing resources go um, for which projects get taken to the next level. Um, does that, is that, does that make sense to people? Does that seem, okay. Um, Nicole, did you have something you wanted to? Okay, but could you, <laughs> what challenges do you see? I'm gonna put you on the spot. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, here in Rhode Island, one of the biggest challenges I've been having is just like reaching the people. And, um, you know, when I talk to my inspectors, they talk about how, um, you know, people are just really unaware of the regulation, whether they have to comply. And so it's frustrating because you're trying to offer this programming, but I, but I honestly just feel like deep down, it's not getting to a lot of the people and how do I do that? And, and I don't know. Um, so I ended up having a conversation with a new person that was hired in Rhode Island um, at the Rhode Island MEP, which stands for Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Each state has an MEP office. Um, and so one of the things that they had talked about doing was, um, you know, they have this built-in network. Um, so what we're going to do over the upcoming year is try to get at some of the processors and see through their network, do they have better luck reaching them? And um, and, and also I'm sort of toying with the idea of like, you know, working with my DOH to try to get at these people, but it's really a challenge. So in my understanding of the working group, that kind of piece of it falls under the awareness bin. Is that true? The committee? Yeah. Oh, did you want me to talk about the that or something else? Yeah, well, I guess, <laughs> okay. I guess the thing is like, so you're bringing up a challenge and I think um, Martin and Donna and others brought up a challenge um, a similar challenge that I think actually relates to what Annie is talking about, because I think part of what I'm hearing is that the target audience, um, the assumption about the target audience has been food safety communicators, the processors themselves, but there are these intermediary or groups, right? There are regulators, there are inspectors, and then there are these associations like what you're talking about. And then there are state boards of health or other public health sort of groups, you know, I think every state has sort of a different configuration there. And so mm -hmm. maybe those, you know, when I step back and I think about the produce rule, I think the rollout of the produce rule was really facilitated by USDA and state departments of agriculture. And the preventive controls rule is challenged because that isn't the same structure, right? And so it sounds to me like what you're identifying here is a different target audience that needs to be considered in in this in this space and, and and perhaps a few of them and actually maybe Martin or Donna if you're if you're willing to jump in here um, maybe you could say you know what role the working group plays or what you think it could play or what the challenges are with the current structure and how I have a kid home today so hold on just a second <laughs> yes you can ask magic well I I can jump in here I I think um, Hi. One of the <laughs> one of the things that um, I did in in New Jersey was that I worked with the Department of Health, and actually over, yeah, over into Pennsylvania, even with the Philadelphia Department of Health, and we we worked really closely with these different groups back at the beginning of the Food Safety Modernization Act they wrote some grants to be able to, to do the training. So I did training with a lot of these groups and I've done a lot of training with regulators. So in New Jersey, I have, I have lots of these kind of people sending people to me saying, look, you need some training, go to Rutgers, um, you need to take a class. And, and I'll, I'll be honest because, um, I, I, you know, I'm booked pretty far out on as far as my schedule to to do the trainings and do the consulting, as that when the processors approach me saying, well, we won't help with a food safety plan, we won't help with writing this stuff up, I just tell them, you have to take the class first. You come take my class, and then I always encourage them, try to write it yourself, and then hire me to review it for you. Right, because um, I have to charge them. It's going to be expensive for me to just write your plan. It's going to be expensive for any consultant to write your plan. Take the class and you try to do it yourself first, and then get some, you know, and get some help with it afterwards. So I, I don't think I'm I'm quite the same place Nicole is with trying to go out and find people that need my help, and that I, I get plenty of people coming to me. But I did work with. The, the local health departments, the state departments of health, and my um, my federal FDA people for my areas with this in the beginning. So they do funnel people to me. So 
I think I think you're on the right track, Nicole, with saying you, you need to get your Department of Health involved so that they understand they can send people to you when they find people that are non-compliant out there. Yes, yes, and they do, but it's a, it's a slow trickle, and maybe it's because they're inspect they haven't inspected you know a large number under preventive control. So it's you know it's that as well. They've right. they conducted twelve inspections last year. So oh my goodness, okay, it's yeah. And, so and a, you I have something local, go. like we, we've got the New Jersey Food Processors Group, which is a pretty, it's a pretty active group, um, mostly in South, Central to South Jersey, though. We don't reach into North Jersey too well. Mm. Um, but Yeah, I don't know of any organizations like that that are really active in the area, but that's something look to, worth looking into. Right, because that that's where I, I do a lot of work with them, because we can, more of the processors will come to those meetings. And so every meeting, you know, I'm there saying, look, you know, if you haven't, if you haven't written these things up yet, if you haven't been audited yet, you're going to be soon, you know, and once you are, you're going to be in trouble. Please let us help you with this before, you know, you have a regulator come in and look for something you don't have. So that's a, one of the places where I am on a monthly basis is, is meeting with those groups and saying, look, you know, we can help you with this. I could give you a list of people, you know, other states around, but people that can help you with these things. Yeah, okay. So that's really, so from a sort of structural standpoint and how the working group might be able to consider this as part of, as part of their, um, as part of the structure, part of the tasks is maybe to think a little bit more about how you know, work like that, what you've done in New Jersey, Donna, can be extended or um, documented or, you know, creating some of those connections, like perhaps the working group can think a little bit more about, um, about I don't want to say replicating, because I think every state is just really different, but but thinking about how that model can be applied, um, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's a, a challenge that the working group might want to think about in, in a different structure. Um, Nicole, does that seem mm -hmm. close to what you're talking? Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to sort of weigh in on other challenges um, or some other sort of ways that they've interacted or, you know, if you've been a part of one of the committees, um, anything that you've noticed or seen or any gaps that you might have encountered between what you actually see on the ground and the, and the work that the working group has been able to generate? Um, Okay, I'm I'm trying I'm, I'm tempted <laughs> to call on people. Does anyone? Gazin, hi, Annie. Um, <laughs> does anyone want to step in? Um, how about uh, Sarah Sapransky? Do you mind? Or Mark? I see you turning on your screen. <laughs> I think you're on mute though. Yeah, I'll jump in. Thanks. So I just wanted to support what uh, Donna just said. There's got to be like an intermediary between us, the teachers, and the processors. We give them this magical 20-hour class or whatever, and they're kind of on their own. It's just too much um, at once for them. And uh, it seems like there should be a whole nother level of... Uh, helpers <laughs> that that need to work with them you know what i'm saying it, it's there's it, it's a big gap there um and yes the biggest companies that are well off that can afford to uh hire food nerds like us to do it yeah they're all set but uh that leaves still a lot of people in the woods so mark when you say that um are there's a little bit of a I'm a little I want to dig in a little bit to that because part of what I hear you saying is is about the content right like I think one of the things Andrea showed was that there's like a gap um you know people come into the PCQI course and they're they don't it's too advanced for them right so part of it is about the content part of it is about I think what Nicole and Donna were talking about which is just in terms of like the midwife and I, there's probably a better word for that but like the person who brings you know, brings the people in. Um, and so would you, do you mind sort of a, a talking about where you think the working group as it's currently structured, like, is it addressing that? Is it missing the boat? How can you, 
think critically about that structure and how it might change to address what you're talking about? Um, unfortunately, I'm not real familiar with the working group, so I, I'm not uh, prepared to answer that. Um, but that's actually but, an answer, right? So it sounds like <laughs> for, for the folks who are doing this work, maybe there isn't a, a, a broad awareness on, in the field of what, what's happening in the working group, right? And that's important. <laughs> so let me change my question a little. What would make that more compelling, the work that that, that that group and those committees are doing? What would make that more compelling for you to have, to be able to access what is going on with those groups? Oh, uh, knowing about it. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. knowing about my local working group which I'm from Michigan, and uh, I don't know, uh, there, there is a uh, Michigan Food Processors Association, and I did teach classes through them. Um, and that's when I, you know, really saw the critical need for uh, what I just talked about, because uh, just like Donna, you know, you, they, you do what you can to get them through this uh, 20, I was making it into a 28 hour class because I was giving out homework and quizzes and trying to deepen their understanding before giving them the certificate. And uh, I wasn't very popular for doing that, <laughs> by the way. And uh, so yeah, I couldn't to understand where to go, uh, establish something in each region and uh, let the processors uh, know that this exists. Um, I will add one more thing, the uh, TAN, Technical Assistance Network. I've submitted some questions through them and they have yet to answer. So that um, help that I thought and I taught was there has not been as effective as I had hoped. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Don, I see your hand, but I called out Sarah and she kindly responded. So Sarah, I wanna, wanna see if you have anything you wanted to add to this question of the challenges. Hey, I think I'm kinda in the same boat as Mark in that I don't, I'm not terribly familiar with what the work group's been doing over the last year. I like to tune in to the conference because I usually find out about new uh, materials that you've assembled and, and things that are useful for us to know about as regulators. I work for New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. Um, we get asked a lot for places that we can point people, um, especially when we fail them <laughs> on a preventive controls inspection. Um, so any, you know, information that I can glean from these meetings, I, you know, put together and make sure our inspectors are aware of it and that they can pass it along to firms um, whenever appropriate. Um, so that's kind of where, where I'm coming from. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, that's, it's, it's helpful to get that perspective for sure. Yeah. Is there anything, I mean, can you think of any like uh, sort of the question I asked Mark, is there any thing that you think the working group could do or that would be more sort of easy for you to access or make it, you know, outside of, you know, once a year at NECAFs? Like, is there something that you see that would sort of provide a, a conduit a little more regularly for the information that's being generated or the work that's being done? Maybe if you just sent out maybe like a quarterly update like it could even be, I don't know if you have agendas for like the work group meetings, just letting people know what what's coming down the road and, and what we can expect to see in the future. I think That's that great. would be a little bit helpful for me to kind of keep track of what's going on. Um, honestly, some of it gets a little bit abstract for me. I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm just a dummy here. So, <laughs> so when you're talking, you know, about these layers of assessment, I kind of get like, oh, talk to me when we're making something and then I'll understand what's happening. <laughs> but that's really important, right? Like, like for, there's, there's the abstract piece of it and then there's a concrete application. And so I think that might be something that we want to think about too. All right, Donna, go for it. 
Thank you. Thanks oh, so much, Sarah. Uh, so a, a concrete thing that, that I think maybe is we is these small processors don't feel like they can pay for consulting. Okay. So and and as um Mark pointed out, there needs to be people to help them after they take the class. So in the beginning of this, there was a lot of grant money, a lot of funding out there for people to take the class. What I think what is needed now is some some grant money, something to pay for the consulting work to have to to identify those of us who could do the consulting work, but have a way for them to be paid for without the processor having to, to bear the full burden of it or to help make that less expensive for the processor and have the people that are on the working group and the people who do this kind of work have a way for them to work with the processors, maybe at a reduced cost to the processor. I think that that would be something that would be very beneficial to the processors because um, the biggest thing that I hear from them is besides taking the time away from work is the cost of it. As an economist, I, I concur. <laughs> I agree. And I think having resources that are devoted to providing technical assistance is probably a really um, a good a good place to go. And, and so part of the question is, how does that fit into the working group? Um, I don't know, you know, I think maybe we can kick that to the next part of this conversation, um, but I think it's just to, to highlight that that's what you're talking about. Yeah, Mark, I, had one, I, I had one comment I'd like to make, you know, I was just thinking as we were talking about some of this stuff, you know, one of the things we did here at Penn State is we established a, um, you know, we have a, a hotline for our home food preservation, consumer questions, and, you know, it's a, it's a no cost system outside of the fact you know, that we have people in place that can take the calls from at the county level. And what we do is when when a person has a question, you know, they contact the county and then the county basically sends out the question to people who have volunteered within our extension system to mm -hmm. answer the question. And what it allows us to do is it allows somebody to provide information who has that information. So, you know, if somebody calls in and they're, you know, they're making jam you know and you know the question comes in and then you know the question goes out to a group of experts and they somebody says well hey i'll take that you know i can answer that question i wonder if some type of system could be set up that could be similar to that because i know a lot of times you know either people don't have the time or they don't have maybe the, the specific knowledge to answer questions that come into a state you know something comes in and you know i'm not maybe a seafood expert you know so you know maybe i can say hey you know I could send that out to this listserv and maybe, you know, Lori says, Hey, I could, I can answer that specific question because I've got that experience. So I wonder if we had a system like that, that was able to, you know, take in and disseminate questions that could, you know, where we could all help each other, you know, with, with specific knowledge that we have, or maybe the fact that we have more time than somebody else does, you know, to, to answer those types of questions. You know, I, I think it, you know, uh, you know, I know Donna was talking about consulting and, and, you know, she does some of that stuff. And, you know, here at Penn State, we generally, you know, we generally don't, we, we provide, you know, more of that, you know, where to find stuff or how to find stuff or, you know, maybe some basic information. And I think for the first step of that, a lot of times is, you know, providing that, you know, that where to go or how to get it, you know, and if we had a system that was in place that allowed these types of things that came in for us to disseminate that. And then for a person who's knowledgeable to answer that or to get back with that, with that particular client, mm -hmm. I, I think that would be useful. So some kind of network. And I guess, again, my word is not exactly. Yeah, right. Some kind of network, like some, kind of, some kind of, some kind of system that allows, you know, allows us, allows us to capture these issues as they come up. And then to allow that issue then to get distributed to somebody who has either the time and the capability of, you know, of providing that support. Yeah, it, it makes me think of, um, I don't know if this is how it works for you guys, but in our like professional association for economists, we sign up and we click all these boxes about what our area of expertise is. And then when it's time to like review conference ab abstracts or whatever, 
then they say, okay, well, here's the pool of people who said that they were yeah. you know, food safety economists. And then if it's a food safety economics tagged question or abstract, then we're the pool of people who get it. Is that kind of? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But I think it has to be something that's active. I mean, it, you know, yeah. certainly I think we have a system that lists everybody's names and all of that, which is great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if, if you had a system that was a little bit more active, a little bit more, you know, um, where we can collect it, and then immediately disseminate it. You know, again, we, we use this with our, for our consumer questions. And generally, you know, we, we've got a, basically a group of about 12 of us. We can answer pretty much any question that comes in. Generally our time is less than 30 minutes. It's usually mm -hmm. within, you know, 15 minutes, that client gets a call back from somebody, you know, who has that specific knowledge and can help that, that particular client. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Just, just. No, just, that's a great idea. I, I think Annie had a something she wanted. I think it was in response to this. So. Oh yeah. I, well, and I think Martin answered it a little bit, but um, both Donna and Martin, a lot of these um, concerns and desires to like offer direct support to the processor is a little bit what the PCHF website was intended to address. But it sounds like too the big deficiency there is that it's a static resource. Relatively, it'll be updated, but. Um, you know, it, it just sits there. It's not going to kind of walk a processor step by step through the process. If I am understanding sort of your assessment correctly. Okay. Thanks, Annie. Amanda, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I think um, what Donna and Martin are saying are very interesting and realistic components. And, and so for those that don't know, Jill and I have a project with Christina where we actually uh, oh, we will just give these people, these small presses, more, more uh, support. So we gave them like a one-hour webinar before. You don't know what PC is. Here is a one-hour webinar. And then we did a three-hour workshop. And then we did um, the preventive controls, but we kind of followed the small model that Mark did. Instead of 20 hours, we did 28 hours. Then a month later, we hosted and we ripped the blended content and did a reprise with working groups to talk more tangibly about this for the next six months. And still, you know, I naively thought, oh, then everyone will have food safety plans and implement them tomorrow. And that has not happened because they don't, right? They're still deer in the headlights. So I guess I just want to echo the concern. And I think the opportunity, it, in addition to awareness needs to happen. And I think there's a lot of great ideas of how to, leverage new organizations and new strategies are there, but perhaps that handholding that Donna and Martin, were the, the thing to give them that. And I guess the only other thing I want to say is that to, to your point, Donna, I often say to the client, don't hire a food safety person yet. Do all the stuff work first, because it's better for you to know <laughs> and it's cheaper, but you are better for it. But I think there could be some seed ideas here of Martin's idea of this leveraged systems of tech support, Donna's idea of having them own this accountability. But if you have this stuff as a prerequisite, you know, like this continued on-ramp, like, okay, if you do GMPs, then your HACCP, then your PC classes, gives you fundamentals. Then if you come and do your preliminary work, then talk to a consultant, maybe NECAFs can offer tech support at some capacity. But you, I guess I would argue, I would encourage us to think about if this is a thing we could invest in, it's not just giving that away, but they have to show that they're doing the work and now they're ready for the support so it can be more effectively implemented. So let me let me just reframe that. Um, so I think in terms of what the working group is doing or could be doing, it sounds like there's basically a life cycle issue here, right? There are different, um, you know, businesses enter this at different stages and they have a sort of different life cycle. And I think what Martin is talking about is more that like first touch, right? Like how do you how do you get somebody at that first touch to the right information? And then there's all these other steps like what Donna has talked about, what Amanda's talking about, of actually and, and a little bit what Mark was talking about, pulling them through, right? And giving them the support. And how can the working group structure itself to address these different needs at these different stages? Um, so Lori, I think you're next and then Don. Oh no, I'm sorry, Christina and then Lori and then Donna. Christina, go ahead. <clears throat> 
Yeah. Um, and going off of what Martin said, like it, it reminded me of uh, IAFP, International Association of Food Protection, and how they have their PDGs. So the professional development groups and a lot of people go into those and they ask questions to a specific group of people that are kind of targeted and have that expertise in their area. They need a question answered in. And that way you can find a group of people. So NECAFs could possibly have like a group where we kind of categorize all of our participants into different categories. So that automatically feeds into like who is responsible for answering certain types of questions if they were to participate in this type of um, like support. Um, another addition that I had on was um, often like when, when I write food safety plans and I do consulting, you get people when they're really desperate. So they're not going to want to hear like you have to take a three-day course that's only offered three times a year in certain places and that costs $2,500. Um, so we have to kind of catch them when they're not at a vulnerable time because that also kind of plays into their ability to, to go forward with our courses as well. They're not going to really learn to learn. They're going to just want to get it done. Um, so that's what I've seen over the past year or so. You can't really catch them when they're super vulnerable. We have to get them early. Um, so like, how do we go about doing that as well? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, Lori, do you want to go ahead? Um, so I think we're at a point with the small processors who who may or may not need to comply fully, but still need to have, they still need to have modified compliance in a way. And then medium processors who may need full compliance. They're at a point where it's like, just tell me what to do. You know, it's that syndrome. Just tell me what to do and I'll, I'll do it. Um, without fully understanding what they need to do um, and why. And I agree with Mark and everybody else. Um, I think I think we there needs to be some sort of centralized thing through NECAPs to help us do some of this. I think produce has a lot of it. Um, I think we need some sort of centralized help um, because I don't know about other people, but I mean, I'm supposed to be retired, but, um, you know, when I was, Mandy's laughing at me, when I was working uh, full time, this was not the only thing that we did. I mean, you know, we're stretched too thin, doing too many different things, and we can't focus. So to put, put, put cooperative extension people in, in a position where we're, we're now also doing all the follow-up, and I know that's important, and getting you know, trying to give everybody help. That's why I think we really need a central place where we could go to, which is what cooperative extension folks do. I mean, we're always reaching out to our colleagues all over the country that if we know what they do for help, it's something we've always done. But because with a, with a, with a, with this particular issue, the, the issues are so diverse and, you know, products are all over the, 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 the scale here, I think we need a a, 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 a a cooperative extension, you know, or something. Just 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 a, a well of people who we can just go to and say, "Does anybody know about this?" And it's, it's all a little bit like seafood again, <laughs> the the seafood group that we have um, that that is out of now. Oregon has taken the lead on that. Where you just you, you you go on to that that group and you say, "Can anybody help?" And people are always willing to give their advice. I just think that we need something like that, and we need kneecaps to sort of step up and and help us put some of that together. Great. So so what I'm hearing is that the Pre preventive controls working group, whether it's the working group or something else, but somehow kneecaps. Um, the space that NECAFS is creating needs to include something that can provide support a little bit like what Martin was talking about, perhaps, and, and so that people who are in the field have resources. And it, I mean, honestly, I'm going to say this. I, I know this is not what anybody need, wants to hear, but it sounds like a person, right? Um, and, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that out loud and be the mean, the terrible person who says that out loud. Um, just because that's the role I'm in, so here I am. Um, so Donna, do you want to jump in? And then we're going to switch over to the next part. We're a little bit bleeding into the next part anyway, so it's okay, but um, go for it. And so I was just actually just wanting to kind of go back to what Lori said earlier, that, that the thing we're missing is that resource guide that, um, like the seafood HACCP guidance, um, 
which we don't have for all these different things. But I think, I think you've, Amanda, I think you guys have started out with some model plans. And I, I think one of the things that the, the group could really help us with out there is if there were more model plans um, that were accessible for different types of industries so that, you know, it's, rather than just a person who, who knows about this, but if we could post some more of those model plans for the different industries. So when you have someone come to you, if you if you never worked with a coffee processor before, you could say, oh, you know what? There is a model plan that gives you a starting point because that's what a lot of these people just, the starting point. So if you can say, well, here's here's a model plan that's something like yours. Now, if, if they could just fill in the blanks, that's that would help them, I think, tremendously is giving them more of that type of information. Okay, so having, so I, I don't know if the clearinghouse, Annie, is is trying to do that, create more of these model plans that are available. Well, Donna, my lead instructor, trainer, trainer told me that there is never a model. The only model is in that damn book. It is an exercise. <laughs> so let's just get that out of the way. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. That, that was the that that was the officially sanctioned model plan, but uh, yeah, we all know that's not actually that great either. So I didn't mean to. Sorry, Jill. No, that's okay. <laughs> all right, Amanda, go ahead. You you did have your hand up. I was going to uh, just glide on by, but yeah. So I guess I just wanted to. Re I, I think that there could be a um, a nestled idea here because going back to what Martin was saying. And and Mark said to write the tan kind of sucks right now. Like there's the the regulatory tan takes forever, and then there's the other tan that we are all supposedly influenced by. But I don't. It's not as channeled, right? That maybe one way to do this is uh, look at how we could. I don't want to duplicate efforts here, but there is a tan, but it's not leveraged in the capacity. Right, what's that a would, tan? Uh, the technical assistance network. It is within the preventive controls rule. Part of our delivery content says, oh, you're not alone. You just use this website and get an expert. But the regulatory one takes forever to answer. And then the TAN that we are all supposedly an ally to, to answer to the point that we're all talking about is we all know some stuff but we end up calling each other depending on what it is like, Oh crap, it's a fish question. I, I personally will just send a text to Lori or I'll call Donna personally because I know them. But to Mark, if I'm hearing the story collectively, we all know our thing and we're always happy to help one another, but we don't always know the thing. Can we revisit how to use, make a tan or leverage the existing tan, but make it more, how we would want it in a way that could be more powerful for the end user. Yeah, and that, what's one of the things, I guess, when we talked about this listserv that we use for at Penn State, it's not like somebody has to find somebody. You know, the main thing is a question comes in, it goes out to everybody, and then somebody says, you know what, I can get that, and then they get it. And you don't have to sit there and find somebody to find it and, and hunt that down. That's, yeah. where the, that's where the time comes in, where we become very res unresponsive in terms of extension. And again, I think, you know, I, all of us believe in extension. We believe in the work that we do. And we believe that, you know, all of us provide the support. You know, I think what a strong tool that would be, though, if we had ability to, 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 have to develop relationships with, you know, with companies, with, with individuals, where they say, you know what, yeah, extension, that's where I'm going for my, for my question, because I can get somebody to call me back right away. They're going to have the knowledge that it is. So whatever it is, you know, and, and again, I kind of support this, like a, some sort of a listserv or whatever, where it, that is, it is responsive and it is personal where somebody calls somebody up and says, yeah, listen, I can help you with your problem where I can point you in the right direction. You know, it, it goes into these tan things. Like I never send anybody to a tan, you know what, gosh, I, you know, that's just, I actually, I do what Mark does, right? Like, uh, just so you know, I don't know how long it could take. Good luck. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I never like, you know what, I'll find you something, you know, or I'll but find somebody to send you to versus sending somebody to a to a, a box, you, you know. know. And so um, and, and again, I think just developing those relationships. Again, if you don't have the answer, at least they know that, hey, somebody's working on it for me or they're going to help me get it or, you know, they're going to send it to somebody or they're going to put me in touch with somebody who I can talk to um, with my with my problem. 
So to that end, is anyone on the niche meat extension blister? Because I think that that kind of hits that one. Do y'all, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that? yeah. Because it gives you rapid, if you were on that listserv, it shares all this information instantly and someone always responds to a quick, to those type of content. So I don't know if that's a model we want to explore. Okay, so let's just, I think we're moving into the next part of this conversation sort of organically. We're supposed to switch over at 11.45, but that's about now. I just want to revisit the structure that exists right now in light of the conversation that we have just been having. So we have the evaluation committee, the resources committee, and the awareness committee. And the question really is, is this structure serving the, the needs and moving the ball towards the goal? Or do we need to rethink and maybe take some of these ideas that have been generated and the critiques that have been offered and rethink how this is structured and sort of what the goals and the purpose of these committees and this working group are, All right? Barton, go for it. Yeah, you know, I, I think, I, I, you know, this is, I, I've really not sat through a lot of these meetings. And, and one of the things I guess with this is it just becomes, you know, like evaluation where I would just have a technical committee and then it, within the technical committee addressing various issues. And then as issues come up, you can sub team them naturally versus trying to come up with these, you know, these, these different components, like unless there's an evaluation, certainly if there's an evaluation committee working and doing their thing already, great. You know, but I think having a group that that comes up, you know, sits and, and talks about the various aspects of it, and then funnels those, develops those organically, you know, the different groups, and then says, okay, you know, that's your charge if you want to work on that or or whatever. I don't know. That's how less I of a working group with these like categories and more of like a task force that that sort of it, you know takes a temporary they everybody has a year on the task force and rotates around that group is responsible for bring taking issues in and then just I mean, yeah or whatever <laughs> whoever wants to join right you know I think it's like whatever you know just, just right. get it, like you gotta get us like, like we're sitting here now we're coming up with ideas i don't know if you don't have a big group like this where they people bash stuff around and and, and argue about so i just you know i just think it's like I, I personally that's how i like to work you know, I'm sitting here learning and, and listening to things and, and, you know, like, wow, that's a good idea or that's a ba you know, bad idea or whatever. But it's nice to have a, a group like this where you can come in and sit down and, and, and listen to some things. And I don't know. OK, Annie, did you want to did you want to weigh in here? And, and maybe this is a, a weird way in for me since I, I do a lot of the coordinating um, activities for the group, um, like setting agendas and stuff. But um, I do th think that sometimes um, like with the website project, um, because Beth runs resources, she knows the project best. And as we've gotten into this point of evaluating the website, it seems more logical that it would hand off to the evaluation team. But because Beth already knows the website best. It makes, you know, and Beth has been developing the survey tool with me. I think, yeah, that having this three-tier structure sometimes gets in the way of the flow of the projects. And we've seen that sort of naturally work out as the project unfolds. And I, other group members, please disagree with me or, or weigh in on that because I think I'm a little too inside to have a, a neutral perspective. No, that's, that's really, I mean, it's useful, right? Like if somebody, if, if you're the person who has to actually make the stuff, you know, you're where the rubber hits the road, right? So it has to function. <laughs> that's important. Beth, did you want to? Yeah, you know, I was yeah. just going to say, well, part of the evaluation was um, like that group had, the evaluation group had a specific project to do in one of the courses and so it wasn't really that they would do all the evaluations for everything that we we're doing like for the resources subgroup like we had a specific task that we came up with um we you know we created a proposal at a previous meeting we presented it and kind of it went from there and so i just kind of i think that that evaluation of the website is sort of within the scope of that project so each of these i don't know I, I think each of these sort of groups, from my understanding, was like we were all founded and we all had a specific project and a specific sort of goal that we were going 
after. And I think some of those are wrapping up now. Um, and so I think part of this discussion about having these three pillars is now like, well, do you need a resources group anymore to Martin's? Like, do we just make a general group now and come up with projects? Or do we form like a new product and have a new working group uh, attack and um, execute a project? I think that's part of the discussion. Yeah, so that's, I think that's a really um, helpful perspective. So these three subgroups had projects. And I, as far as I understand what you're saying, many of the projects are basically at their natural endpoint anyway. And so maybe this is the time to say, well, these aren't the categories for the committees anymore, because now we have some new projects that are being identified in the course of this conversation that would better serve the long-term goal. So does anybody have a major um, disagreement with that sentiment or, or, but yeah, let's go with that. Let's go. I just want to echo what Beth, uh, as okay. a person that's been on the working group member, a couple of things. One, mm -hmm. I want to echo exactly what Beth said is I feel, and on behalf of the working group, there's a love lost here. This is why we want to have this discussion and open table that um, if anyone is interested in actually being a member of this working group, we would love more participation um, in the future. So just as a component to that. Um, so yeah, now I think if we want to have this conversation about, all right, do we, we don't, maybe we don't need any of the pillars, but we want to have that conversation here. I would say the awareness campaign, we have not actually raised awareness as I mentioned yesterday. So I think that that needs to be some sort of activity. It's in the queue. We have a plan, but you know, that is just my two cents. Okay, so it sounds like the evaluation and the resources are the two committees that have projects that are coming to a natural end, but awareness, I should have known this, not so much. So maybe um, the, the group that is, the group that has some, um, a, you know, the, the people who are working on the awareness part might want to continue that, that portion of it. And then maybe some of these other issues with technical assistance network, et cetera, are things that we need to generate differently and perhaps the evaluation and resources group reach their natural end. I think, Nicole, you're, you're up next. Yeah, with the evaluation, like in one respect, yes, it's reached its end, but in the other respect, we have to continue to collect the data, analyze the data and, and pool the data. So I think uh -huh. it has like, um, I think it can still simmer along, you know, as other groups emerge and, you know, I think it still has relevance. Um, That's but exactly not, what I was going to say, Nicole, yeah. is um, the research, in my opinion, the research group and evaluation, it is fair to say that the foundational structure has been built, but there's going to need to be a sustainable management component, whether it be foraging new resources or managing that component and assuming people are on board with using the same evaluation tool, data has to be centralized and with the, make sure the mechanics are happening. So it's not as big of a lift, but it's still work. Mm -hmm. So that, so they don't have a natural end. <laughs> Maybe this portion of it is at a natural end, but they still have ongoing work. Now, for me, this raises a question about, you know, does NECAFs have the bandwidth to really create more committees, right? Like, so there are these, these issues that have come up about what would, what could, you know, what is lacking, what might, be able to fill that space and improve, you know, how do we identify who our target audiences are? How do we reach out to some of these intermediary groups that might help us reach the target audiences? How do we use the networks of expertise more efficiently to, to parcel out questions and to find mutual support? So these are all things that people have been identifying, um, but, but if there are already three committees that are ongoing, and there's already some concern about pulling people in to support these committees. What, what is the sort of natural next step here? That's that's kind of the question that's coming up for me. Lori, did you want to weigh in? I, I just really have a question slash comment. I, I know I saw this yesterday, but I don't know what the... Where's AFTO in all of this? I mean, here is the, you know... We're in the, conversations with AFTO. Well, we got to a point of we, we met with them looking for some... I don't, I, I want to be, it was being cheeky with Donna, but the adjective is wrong, like endorsement, support, what we want 
and to have AFTO on our communication strategy so that they can help us with the dissemination. But what we found out was they will not promote giving guidance to um, the resource plan that we are developing until they see it because they want to have that rigor. So that's where it was like, okay, well, we will continue to maintain communications with them, but we can't actually ask for the ask until the website materials are already built so that they can see and we can demonstrate the rigor that we um, collaborated on to make it useful. So the other part of this, Amanda, and obviously you know, is there's that side of it. And then there's the side of it is reaching out to the processors. Yes. That so that they can help get those folks into the classes. Yes. You know, meet with us, do that. Where are they with that? That well, we didn't get that far. We do we in recaps, Annie's been doing FOIA requests, freedom of information to get okay. access to the processors. UMass has our own, we have our own directory okay. where we so we have corralled access to processors they're mostly secondary it's not you know the ones we have from extension directly and then these other ones that are their info at lines but those are happening right now in the back scene on the awareness campaign so that when things are ready to rock and roll we'll be able to ditch it out yeah they, i think they're really important in all of this to get where you where where they yeah are. but i think like nicole nicole's kind of re- recommendation about revisiting mep is an opportunity um, you know, and then uh, to Donna's point, she's got a great relationship with state boards of health. I have a decent relationship with them, but they're not very responsive to establishing a relationship or doing that work. And I think part of it is because it ain't a problem right now. I did just use ain't, so your mother might faint. But with all seriousness, in Massachusetts, the same thing is happening. Like Rhode Island, we're not getting calls yet about the PC rule because there hasn't been a lot of inspections. But I can just see it. It's coming. It's just not here yet. So there's very little motivation for processors to listen to us until they get shut down or the Fed show up. And then they start using the language that no one knows and then spiral effect. And it also depends on the DOH. I mean, my DOH mentioned they've been nice. They go in. Oh, you don't have an attestation. You're going to need to get an attestation. They could easily kill them. And oh, well, and I'm going to now you're evaluated under the whole rule. So, you know, it's, um, so these companies really just don't know. Donna, you want to move me in here? Oh, you're on mute. Um, I I think from the response a few minutes ago, I think a lot of people weren't aware of Sean Stevens. Sean Stevens is the, he's the attorney that goes up against Bill Marler. So he's the one that's on the processor side on these really big, you know, uh, prosecutions that have taken place for food processors. Um, so I developed a, a personal relationship with him. I, um, he's going to be a speaker at the New Jersey Food Processors Annual Meeting that's coming up. Um, but I, he, he has a blog and he sends out these articles. And um, one of the things that that I do is is whenever they publish something new and and like last week the FDA just sent out this uh, information about the first big salmonella outbreak with an indoor growing environment um, you know uh, horticultural thing Um, whenever those sort of um, articles come out is I clip those articles and I send them out to my whole list of people that have been in classes that are people that I'm in touch with and I just say look this is where it's happened because I know some of the people that that that's going out to have those type of indoor growing operations and I've been telling them you know your your operation is at risk for this sort of thing happening so whenever there's regulatory things that happen I I send them out to everybody and say look if you you know, if you don't go ahead and finish up that food safety plan and close the gaps that you have there, you know, we're we're starting to see a lot more inspections. Maybe you're not seeing them in your state, but they're happening. You know, the the, the inspectors have started going out 
after they didn't during the beginning parts of COVID. And they're they're starting to take action against the FSMA regulations. So wherever that is in the US, you know, I pull those those news articles. And, um, you know, the food safety news and Bill Marler's blogs and whatnot, I pull those things out and make sure that I post those and send them out to people saying, look, you could be next. And I know some people don't like that, I, I, that they say I use scare tactics, but I feel it more like it's, it's the reality. This is what's happening and you could be the next one. So that's, that's just one of the things I do for that. I do the same thing with the FDA warning letters. So, um, so in terms of the working group and the working group structure, um, I guess Annie um, and Amanda and Beth um, and Cole and, and anyone else who's you know active in these working groups, part of the you know the goal of this session is to try to understand whether the structure right now is working or not. And it'd be great if people think it's not working, if we could come up with some alternative, we may not be able to in a, in a session during a conference. But I, I wanna take a little bit of a moment here to just um, do a gut check and try to ask people whether we think that the current structure, these new ideas, uh, it can absorb these new ideas Right, so can this idea of um, thinking about different target audiences, can that be absorbed in the awareness committee, for example? Could the resources committee absorb this idea of, an, of a new TAN structure, for example? Or do we think that this structure is, is not going to be able to encompass some of these new needs that have been identified? So um, I'm not exactly sure the right process. My, my way of doing it on Zoom is the thumbs up, thumbs down. So I'm gonna ask the question, do we think that the current structure with the evaluation resources and awareness committees is the right way to go forward with some of the new ideas that have come up? And if you think that it's sufficient and has the flexibility for that, then I'd like you to give me a thumbs up. And you think it's not sufficient and we need a new structure, I'd like you to, to give me a thumbs down. And I'd like you all to vote. <laughs> please, please no, no passing on this. Okay, it looks like we've got some thumbs up. Thumbs up. Is any okay? So I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. I haven't seen any thumbs downs. Is that how you say that? I'm not sure. Anyway, the point is, oh, Annie says no. Okay, we've got a no up there from Annie. Okay, so Annie, is there, is there anyone else who says no, that they think the structure isn't sufficient, it can't sufficiently absorb? Okay, Annie, why don't you tell us what you think um, the shortcomings are? I think we have the capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. I think with our current group members and workload, it's an ask. Um, and so if we found a way to say, you know, over the next six months, we're going to consistently devote X amount of time to these projects so that we can make room for these new things. And we're going to sort of be able to fold it into our structure because we've shifted priorities. It would be doable, but I think right now, it's it would be a challenge to really try and accommodate these new projects within the group as it stands. So so let me just ask a little bit of a, a poking question there. To me, that sounds more like um, a personal resources issue within the committees than it does about the structure of the committees. Is that is that true? I think that's fair. I think a lot of okay. work gets put on the folks in the committees as is and yeah. you guys feel free to correct me if you feel otherwise but um you know I can be the legs of things but I I can only do so much in sort of directing people's vision and getting it out there and so I think yeah actually having the the staffing and capacity to do something like a tan is mm -hmm. definitely a challenge okay so so let me let me separate those two things though because I think I think what you're saying is really important I don't want to put it under the rug but I do think it's a separate question of whether the structure can absorb some of these ideas. 
and whether there are people who are willing to step up to make some of these ideas actually happen. That's, those aren't quite the same. So, so just, are you okay with that? Yeah, that no, that's fair. Okay. Okay. So um, before we move into that next question of who, what are the priorities now, right? So we've identified kind of a laundry list. It's not, not a, I wouldn't call it a bulleted list because there are a lot of different ideas that kind of overlap with each other and maybe aren't crystal clear. But the next question after that is like, who wants to step up and prior, how do we prioritize these things and who wants to step into that? And actually, um, before we go there, Donna and Amanda both had their hands up. So Donna, do you want to go ahead? Oh, mute again. Okay. So, so I just had a question that what I was just saying about maybe posting posting these events as they come up, is there, where, where would that fit into the structure you have now? Would that fit into resources or awareness? I, I don't know. Amanda, Beth, Annie, do you, how would you think of it? I guess I'm going into today's conversation is the details aren't ironed out, but I think some, that's a structural, question that you could put that in awareness or resources but it seems like the buckets it seems like the ideas that we are talking about could follow one of these three pillars and into the conversation that Annie mentioned before I I don't think that we need to be so rigid that we have to fit in this bucket but well, just thinking about overarching the re the reason I'm asking the question is I I mean I could volunteer to to be adding much if, if it's just somewhere just to post these things um where people going to your resources would see them i mean i i could definitely volunteer to be sending you those things as i pull them up yeah. so that's, great. That, that's just the reason i would i would volunteer yeah. to help with that if you Thank told you. me where and how and what that's great yeah those so the, the other thing i was going to say back to, to annie's question about uh i i don't i don't want to diffuse the reality of the workload of the ideas that were being discussed today. But I guess I, I come to today's table to thinking about we're not going to do all of these things. And and Annie, we had talked about doing that damn evaluation like four, I mean four years ago or something. Like, yeah, some of the stuff is moving at glacier speed, but you know what? The work is getting done. But I think it's important to think about, okay, well, if this is what we all agree that gosh darn it, we would be way more effective to have a TAN or more direct technical support to the user. We make that a priority. I didn't say we're going to solve the problem by next February. I'm saying we make it a priority and we start thinking about what can we do with the resources we have right now or what are the resources we need to actually do that work? Because frankly, that's how you came, girl is that we're like, crap, we still can't do this because to best point, we're all scrapping along some side gig and trying to do the best that we can, but it's not a priority. And then the NECAS PI team said, well, crap, this isn't working. Let's make a new priority and hire a person that can. So I think that that's the stuff that we need to think about now so that we can be more effective to get to the end game. And it ain't a today idea. It's you know today and a few years out. So I'm going to recap, and then Andrea, I think you had something to add. So I, just to just to sort of distill a little bit, what Amanda is saying is that part of this conversation is, first of all, I think that we're in agreement that the structure of the working group is sufficient to incorporate these new ideas that are coming up. So we don't need to do some sort of major overhaul of the structure. The question then becomes, to Donna's point, which of these ideas goes in which pillar? And then the next question is, how do we prioritize? And are the resources you know, existing in this group now and people have the bandwidth like Donna is offering to help you know, sort of move some of that information through so it can be more publicly available? Or are these things that are identified for future resource needs, right? For grants or for some other sort of way to um, fund some you know, staff that would help do the work that people are identifying. Um, so Andrea, do you want to step in? Sorry, I hope I didn't. <laughs> I hope I didn't step here on you. Oh, oh no. Um, it was just, I guess, addressing Donna's point about sending the news articles and the blog updates. We it could possibly be added to the website or possibly like as like a news feed section, so it doesn't actually get vetted. 
but um, it's just something for people to read through. They don't take advice from it, but it's just something they can read through and, you know, they could get email alerts. And so that would keep engagement up for the website as well. That's a great point. Um, okay, so Beth, yes, go for it. I was just going to echo what Andrea said. It could easily, a oh, news feed could easily be added to the website. Um, but um, to Annie's point, there would have to be someone to manage that news feed and to be able to put up. Now, I make a news feed on my website. It takes like two minutes to pop in articles. So it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then towards Andrea's other point, like if it's a listserv that we would go out with, then I would think that would fall maybe more under awareness mm -hmm. than, than having Amanda and Luke facilitate that. So, so it could be both easily. Okay. Okay. So in terms of a, a sort of process question for this group, I'm, I'm feeling like right now there are a lot of ideas that have been generated and I believe they're all there, but I don't have them in front of me. We're not in a room where we have a, a flip chart, right? Where it's all sort of staring us in the face. Um, and so I'm not sure if, if our next steps are to sort of continue tossing some of these ideas around and identifying people who would help with different ideas and figuring out which pillar different ideas would go in and trying to think about the prioritization, or if that's something that needs to be done once the ideas that are generated have been sort of collated and, and they're right in front of our face. So I guess I'm putting that to the group, a little bit to Annie um, and Beth and Amanda and Nicole and other people who have been active in these committees about what you think, um, you know, how, how the rest of this time should be used. Anyone? I'll make a call. <laughs> Nobody has a anything. I, I really don't have an opinion necessarily about that. Um, I don't know. Well, let, let me say that so differently. Is, is anyone out there, is there anything that people feel like hasn't come up yet that really needs to be discussed in a group? Any other ideas, any challenges, any opportunities that we're missing? any sort of you know, concrete reason that hasn't already been identified about why some of these paths forward are perhaps not gonna work or you know, what the challenge might, challenges might be in trying to pursue them? Uh, well, now, now I will <laughs> be on Annie's side to say the thing that's getting me itched to like, okay, ugh, how would we do that is a channeled centralized network to provide better technical support for the region about specific stuff and the things that Martin's recommending. And I don't, we're not gonna solve that today, but it does introduce a lot of um, different technical questions about the realities of how you would do that, structure, admin, resources, and those kind of things. So that's not what you asked, Jill, but I'm just mind dumping of, um, you're we're not going to solve that in the next 10 minutes right um but that to me is the screaming thing that comes to the table that i've been thinking about if, all right well i think it's a really good idea how do we tap that idea and i so i guess that that's where my head's at does anybody feel like they have um they i i don't have this right now but i'm wondering if anybody feels like of the ideas that have come up they're ready to sort of put them on the screen, maybe in the chat, and then we can all sort of think about how we would upvote or downvote the priority of, of different ideas. Does any, I, I don't have, I, <laughs> I wasn't taking notes, so I don't have this in front of me right now, um, and Zoom is not the best tool. The alternative would be that we review the notes and that, you know, NECAFS sends out some kind of poll to sort of see, you know, what how important people think some of these different ideas are, and how to prioritize the resources, and then um, try to, you know, depending on what that priority list looks like, try to find the people who could help move the ball. No one. Annie, what do you think? As as the kneecaps person, I'm going to pass it to you to I was <laughs> make just a call. About to, yeah, to jump in. Um, I was going to say if. 
we want to just sort of quickly talk through to make sure we have them all. Um, we can put up a quick Zoom poll where people can kind of vote on their number one priority of the, the issues, um, or I guess projects um, that the working group is facing. Okay. So um, can you program that poll? Yes. Um, one sec. Uh, so if you, what is your highest priority of PC projects? Okay. So um, the way I see it, the current projects being discussed are ongoing uh, resources work, ongoing evaluation work, uh, the awareness campaign. Uh, sorry, I am talking and typing and I'm bad at it. Uh, some sort of centralized um, support tool, such as a TAN, but not necessarily a TAN. Um, um, I think the idea that Nicole and Donna were talking about, about trying to work with intermediary organizations, mm -hmm. departments of health, um, training. We call it direct support. technical support. That makes sense. Direct technical, is that, I wouldn't consider those people, I would think direct technical support would be directly to SMPs. Okay, so that's, I think that's different though than what Donna and Nicole were talking about, right? Like right. outreach to these intermediary organizations. Okay. So I would so, put those as two separate things. Okay. Um, okay. Does anyone else, I, I feel like there are more ideas out there. Does anyone else remember any, or do we have any notes about, Somebody's taking notes, right? Who's taking notes? It's me. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're yeah. doing it. <laughs> um, I guess I shouldn't have uh, been surprised about that because that's. Yeah. Just... Um, I think this is most of what we have building the relationship with intermediary, intermediary orgs. Oh, um, I guess communicating group projects and plans mm. better. Right, right. That was a great idea that Mark came up with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. I think this covers most of it. Oh, um, this is a little bit of a, a sub plan, but um, more accessible model plans. Hmm. Does anybody else remember anything that they, they mentioned or suggested that isn't making it in this list? Okay. So are we doing this as a rank or? So uh, Lewis from Perform Media is our, our point man on this. Um, so yeah, if if we have an option to rank them, that would be great. Otherwise, if we can have folks go through and just pick their top priority, that's probably going to be the most informative. So it's a, a little bit of a dot poll with one dot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you want, I can share a screen and we could have people... Um, can we have people mark up in Zoom? If you, yeah, you can. You have, if the annotate feature is on, which it looks like it is, yes. Okay. Okay. Just make sure before you close the screen, though, you have to take a screenshot. You can't save it. Mm, thank you. Okay. How about I do that? Then I'll um, put this up as a document and we can have folks. All right. So I'll stop sharing. And then do you want us to use stamps like the heart star and check or you know, what, how do you want us to report our feelings? I think this we can individualize it, right? <laughs> as long as we're. Okay. Thank you for your patience, folks. I think while Annie's doing this, um, I know there are a couple people on this call that we really haven't heard from <laughs> at all. <laughs> and so I know I am usually really shy, believe it or not. Um, and so it's really hard for me to speak up during meetings. So if you do have like ideas or things that you think of, I mean, even if like you go to sleep night and you're like, oh my gosh, why didn't I this earlier? 
I think that we're all open to receiving more ideas, like, so to continue the discussion. So uh, I just, like, if too afraid to speak up here in this sort of public venue, like, feel free to reach out to um, and I, I would say any of us, I'll volunteer everybody. Um, so myself or Annie or Amanda um, or Jill couldn't even be a conduit. Um, I, you know, Nicole. So I, I just want to just make sure that that's like out there and I'll pop my email address into the chat box. So you guys can shoot me an email if you do come up with anything. That's great. Thanks, Beth. Everybody in this group is really nice. That's why I agreed to do this. <laughs> so I wouldn't, I would just take that into advisement if you're sort of like wondering whether or not to say something. All right. So for those that might not know how to use annotate, if you go to the top of your screen, there's a, a view options tab. And if you hit on the word annotate, a bar is going to present up with a mouse, a text, a drawing feature stamp. And so if you hit the text option, you can then rank your things. But you can then start adding to the sections. Annie, I have that poll ready. Oh, I think um, let's wait because I think this might actually be a good sub. I think so far I'm seeing good feedback from folks by uh, using annotate. All right. Thank you. Okay, does anyone need more time? Got a couple of people in there still. If, you, if you're not exactly sure how to make it all work, definitely just pipe, pipe up and we can have, I, I don't know how to answer the question of annotate, but <laughs> somebody else can. Okay. What do you think? Any do you guys do you guys think this is enough? It sounds it looks to me like I saw lots of names pop up and I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, All right. So I tell me if you see it the way I see it. For awareness campaign, I see three firsts and two stars. I'm gonna count that as five. <laughs> um and then for the uh 
more accessible model plans, I see five stars and a three. Is that is that what you guys are seeing? So I sort of see those as the top two, awareness campaign and more accessible model plans. Um, and then I see four firsts and a second for work with intermediate organizations. So I would sort of think of that as the third rank. Um, and, and now we're getting into definitely a, a qualitative analysis of how to rank the, <laughs> the different uh, uh, emojis or you know all that. But um, I guess I would then put uh, direct technical support and better project communication. Does that seem, I mean, this is this is definitely not an exact science, but anybody, so that, that's what it looks like to me. If anybody thinks that I should be um, evaluating these <laughs> slightly differently, please let me know. Um, Annie, do, do you agree with that? Can you read back what I just said? Because I immediately forgot once I said it out loud. I am sorry, because I'm in the screen share, I oh, didn't no, have the recording. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna do a combined scoring after the fact though, that I can right. send out where okay. I assign point values. Okay. Well, I, I think I think this is I think it's interesting. Um, I mean, first of all, I think the awareness campaign. I think everybody recognized. You know, that that was a running theme. I think really through the whole conversation, right? Is just making sure that the people who need this information have access to this information. So I'm not surprised to see that that's something that people still consider to be a priority. Um, and the um, the model plans. I think that also makes a lot of sense. What bin what pillar does that go into that's resources right okay right, so that goes into resources better project communication i would put that in awareness yeah so that's like reaching out to other food safety communicators to give updates about what the pc working group is doing right so that other food safety communicators are kept apprised of you know how things are going with the three committees um, so direct technical support, I think Andrea's comment is right on. That's a heavy lift. Um, that's probably going to require leveraging current resources to find future resources. It's, I think that's the kind of thing if you start it, but you don't have a plan and staffing and funding to continue it, you kind of get yourself a little bit in a corner. Um, so, but I, it does seem to be important to people. Um, and then this working with intermediary organizations, um, I guess I would put that in awareness. Does that seem to fit for people? To me, this is sort of like the idea of, of maybe <laughs> asking Donna to do a deep dive on really how she um, structured her work and, and understanding a little more about how New Jersey is set up and thinking about how that could be replicated in some form or fashion in other places. Um, and, and then, you know, following up on some of the work that Nicole has been doing and, and work that other folks have been doing with some of these intermediary organizations. Is that, so, so that's, that's, this is my sort of attempt at an off the cuff <laughs> uh, recap of where things are. I think the next question, I think Annie, you know, you putting this into some sort of document and then the next step is really finding people. Um, who can, who can join and support this work and thinking, I think I would sort of suggest that um, the folks who are already on these committees and NECAFs maybe take a moment to think about what the commitment is, like what the ask is, how to communicate what that commitment is to people who might be considering what they can offer um, and then and trying to give some structure to that so that people don't think they're jumping into the abyss, right? Like this, this could go on this could go deep and far. Um, so people probably before they are gonna make a commitment are gonna wanna know what that commitment looks like. Um, so that's just my recommendation. Does anyone else wanna to weigh in? Um, I this, you know, this conversation is one of those things where you sort of open the Pandora's box. <laughs> it's a little scary, um, but I really appreciate uh, all the participation that folks have been um, you know, folks have been joining and participating in this conversation. I hope it's been useful. Um, is there anything else that people want to sort of put on the table before we, we wrap it up? 
Any? Okay. All right. Well, I can see my, I can hear my child making loud noises downstairs. So I'm getting a little anxious. This is our first day of our, of our COVID exposure isolation. So <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> Um, but I should probably go down and see what's broken. And um, I really appreciate uh, the work that you guys do. Um, and thanks for, you know, for being part of this conversation. And thanks to Annie and Amanda um, for helping me learn this crazy universe. <laughs> Hopefully from my end, we can sort of do some, some other work on the sort of policy picture about the costs and about what is motivating people, um, folks to, to participate in PC and have some sort of, you know, empirical work that supports what you guys do that hopefully will leverage resources to support you guys being able to reach out more. That's kind of my, my angle on all this. I think that's it. Annie, Amanda. Beth, that's great. Thank Paul, you so anyone? much, Jill. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for participating today too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It yeah. a lot. Absolutely. Awesome. We really value And thanks input. Jill for coming. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Send me pizzas. I think we're going to need a lot of pizza <laughs> for the next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to go have fun. Okay. All right. See you later. Thank you. Bye -bye. Um, to let everybody know our schedule Bye. coming up, we've got lunch until 1 30. And then at 1 30, we'll be uh, meeting back up in um, another Zoom room for the report out and closing remarks. Um, you'll want to access that room from the conference page because I believe it is not this same Zoom room. Um, so just a heads up in advance. And uh, I'll see you all guys after lunch.